Giovanni Battista Morgani, Wikipedia Audio Giovanni Battista Morgani was an Italian anatomist, generally regarded as the father of modern anatomical pathology, who taught thousands of medical students from many countries during his 56 years as professor of anatomy at the University of Padua. His most significant literary contribution, the monumental five-volume on the seats and causes of disease, embodied a lifetime of experience in anatomical dissection and observation, and established the fundamental principle that most diseases are not vaguely dispersed throughout the body, but originate locally, in specific organs and tissues. His parents were in comfortable circumstances, but not of the nobility, it appears from his letters to Giovanni Maria Lanzisi that Morgani had ambitions to improve his rank. It may be inferred that he succeeded from the fact that he is described on a memorial tablet at Padua as Nobilis Forolensis, noble of Forli, apparently by right of his wife. At the age of 18 he went to Bologna to study philosophy and medicine, and he graduated with much praise as a doctor in both faculties three years later, in 1701. He acted as prosector to Antonio Maria Valsalva, who held the office of demonstrator anatomicus in the Bologna school, and whom he assisted more particularly in preparing his celebrated work on the anatomy and diseases of the ear, published in 1704. Education Many years after, in 1740, Morgani edited a collected edition of Val Salva's writings, with important additions to the treatise on the ear, and with a memoir of the author. When Val Salva was transferred to Parma Morgani succeeded to his anatomical demonstratorship. At this period he enjoyed a high repute in Bologna, he was made president of the Academia Inquietorum when in his 24th year and he is said to have signalized his tenure of the presidential chair by discouraging abstract speculations, and by setting the fashion towards exact anatomical observation and reasoning. He published the substance of his communications to the Academy in 1706 under the title of Adversaria Anatomica, the first of a series by which he became favorably known throughout Europe as an accurate anatomist. The book included observations of the larynx, the lachrymal apparatus, and the pelvic organs in the female. After a time he gave up his post at Bologna, and occupied himself for the next two or three years at Padua, where he had a friend in Domenico Guglielmini, professor of medicine, but better known as a writer on physics and mathematics, whose works he afterwards edited with a biography. Guglielmini desired to see him settled as a teacher at Padua, and the unexpected death of Guglielmini himself made the project feasible, Antonio Vallisneri being transferred to the vacant chair, and Morgani succeeding to the chair of theoretical medicine. He came to Padua in the spring of 1712, being then in his 31st year and he taught medicine there with the most brilliant success until his death on December 6, 1771. Morgani G.B. Founders of Modern Medicine, Giovanni Battista Morgani Medical Library and History Journal 1. 277 PMC 169-8114 PMID 1834813 When he had been three years in Padua an opportunity occurred for his promotion to the chair of anatomy, in which he became the successor of an illustrious line of scholars, including Vesalius, Gabriel Falopio, Geronimo Fabrizio, Gasrius, and Adrianus Spigelius and in which he enjoyed a stipend that was increased from time to time by vote of the Senate until it reached 1,200 gold ducats. Shortly after coming to Padua he married a noble lady of Forli, 
who bore him three sons and twelve daughters. Morgani enjoyed an unequalled popularity among all classes. He was of tall and dignified figure, with blonde hair and lilac eyes, and with a frank and happy expression, his manners were polished, and he was noted for the elegance of his Latin style. He lived in harmony with his colleagues, who are said not even to have envied him his unprecedentedly large stipend, his house and lecture theater were frequented tan quam offi china sapienci by students of all ages, attracted from all parts of Europe, he enjoyed the friendship and favor of distinguished Venetian senators and of cardinals, and successive popes conferred honors upon him. Before he had been long in Padua the students of the German nation, of all the faculties there, elected him their patron, and he advised and assisted them in the purchase of a house to be a German library and club, for all time. He was elected into the Imperial Cesario Leopoldina Academy in 1708, and to a higher grade in 1732 into the Royal Society in 1724, into the Paris Academy of Sciences in 1731, the St. Petersburg Academy in 1735, and the Berlin Academy of Sciences in 1754. Among his more celebrated pupils were Antonio Scarpa, Domenico Cotugno, and Leopoldo Marco Antonio Caldani, the author of the magnificent Atlas of Anatomical Plates published in two volumes at Venice in 1801-1814. In his earlier years at Padua, Morgani brought out five more series of the Adversaria Anatomica, these his strictly medical publications were few and casual. Classical scholarship in those years occupied his pen more than anatomical observation. It was not until 1761, when he was in his 80th year, that he brought out the great work which, once for all, made pathological anatomy a science, and diverted the course of medicine into new channels of exactness or precision the decidibus et causes morborum per anatomem indigatus of the seats and causes of diseases investigated through anatomy, in five books printed as two folio volumes, which during the succeeding ten years, notwithstanding its bulk, was reprinted several times in its original Latin and was translated into French, English, and German languages. The only special treatise on pathological anatomy previous to that of Morgani was the work of Theophile Bonnet of New Chattel, Sepulchritum, Siv Anatomia Practica ex Cadaveribus Morbodinatus, The Cemetery, or, Anatomy Practiced from Corpses Dead of Disease first published in 1679, three years before Morgani was born, it was republished at Geneva in 1700, and again at Leiden in 1709. Although the normal anatomy of the body had been comprehensively, and in some parts exhaustively, written by Vesalius and Fallopius, it had not occurred to anyone to examine and describe systematically the anatomy of diseased organs and parts. Harvey, a century after Vesalius, poignantly remarks that there is more to be learned from the dissection of one person who had died of tuberculosis or other chronic malady than from the bodies of ten persons who had been hanged. Francis Glisson indeed shows in a passage quoted by Bonnet in the preface to the Sepulchritum, that he was familiar with the idea, at least, of systematically comparing the state of the organs in a series of bodies, and of noting those conditions which invariably accompanied a given set of symptoms. The work of Bonnet was, however, the first attempt at a system of morbid anatomy, and, although it dwelt mostly upon curiosities and monstrosities, it enjoyed much repute in its day, Haller speaks of it as an immortal work, 
which may in itself serve for a pathological library. Career Morgani, in the preface to his own work, discusses the defects and merits of the sepulchritum, it was largely a compilation of other men's cases, well and ill-authenticated, it was prolix, often inaccurate and misleading from ignorance of the normal anatomy, and it was wanting in what would now be called objective impartiality, a quality which was introduced as decisively into morbid anatomy by Morgani as it had been introduced two centuries earlier into normal human anatomy by Vesalius. Morgani has narrated the circumstances under which the Decidibus took origin. Having finished his edition of Valsalva in 1740, he was taking a holiday in the country, spending much of his time in the company, of a young friend who was curious in many branches of knowledge. The conversation turned upon the sepulchritum of Bonnet, and it was suggested to Morgani by his dilettante friend that he should put on record his own observations. It was agreed that letters on the anatomy of diseased, organs and parts should be written for the perusal of this favoured youth, and they were continued from time to time until they numbered seventy. Those seventy letters constitute the Decidibus et causes morborum, which was given to the world as a systematic treatise in two volumes, folio, twenty years after the task of epistolary instruction was begun. The letters are arranged in five books, treating of the morbid conditions of the body a caput ad calcium, and together containing the records of some 646 dissections. Some of these are given at great length and with a precision of statement and exhaustiveness of detail hardly surpassed in the so-called protocols of the German pathological institutes of the present time, others, again, are fragments brought in to elucidate some question that had arisen. The symptoms during the course of the malady and other antecedent circumstances are always prefixed with more or less fullness, and discussed from the point of view of the conditions found after death. Subjects in all ranks of life, including several cardinals, figure in this remarkable gallery of the dead. Many of the cases are taken from Morgani's early experiences at Bologna, and from the records of his teachers Valsalva and I.F. Albertini not elsewhere published. They are selected and arranged with method and purpose, and they are often made the occasion of a long excursus on general pathology and medicine. During his career as a physician he was careful to take extensive notes on many of his consultations. These writings allow the modern reader to observe his practice and description of the body through his own words. We are further able to examine the progress of Morgani's study of anatomy as it related to his treatment of patients. We are further able to view a particular perspective of a single physician in the context of the 18th century when he lived in order better understand medical practice during this time period. The range of Morgani's scholarship, as evidenced by his references to early and contemporary literature, was very broad. It has been contended that he was himself not free from prolixity, the besetting sin of the learned, and certainly the form and arrangement of his treatise are such as to make it difficult to use in the present day, notwithstanding that it is well indexed in the original edition, in that of Tizot, and in more recent editions. It differs from modern treatises insofar as the symptoms determine the order and manner of presenting the anatomical facts. His 1769 work described the post-mortem findings of air in cerebral circulation and surmised this was the cause of death. Although Morgani's cases resulted from gas embolism due to damage to the bowel, the same pathology is seen in decompression illness. Although Morgani was the first to understand and to demonstrate the absolute necessity of basing diagnosis, prognosis and treatment on an exact and comprehensive knowledge of anatomical conditions, 
he made no attempt to exalt pathological anatomy into a science disconnected from clinical medicine and remote from practical experience with the scalpel, his precision, his exhaustiveness, and his freedom from bias are his essentially modern or scientific qualities, his scholarship and high consideration for classical and foreign work, his sense of practical ends, and the breadth of his intellectual horizon prove him to have lived before medical science had become largely technical or mechanical. Early Career Middle Career His treatise was the commencement of the era of steady, or cumulative progress in pathology and in practical medicine. From that time on, symptoms ceased to be made up into more or less conventional groups, each of which was a disease, on the other hand, they began to be viewed as the cry of the suffering organs, and it became possible to develop Thomas Sidenham's grand conception of a natural history of disease in a Catholic or scientific spirit. Late Career Legacy Eponymous Structures Sources a biography of Morgani by Mosca was published at Naples in 1768. His life may also be read in Angelo Fabroni's Vitae Illustre. I taller, and a convenient abridgment of Fabroni's memoir will be found prefixed to Tizot's edition of the De Sedibus, etc. A collected edition of his works was published at Venice in five volumes folio in 1765.